Are we live? Oh, hold on a sec. All right. It says you're live. Well. Let's check this ride. <laughs> Are we live? Can can anyone watching tell us we're live? Are we live? Live? Life after college. <laughs> New subscriber. Oh. Look at this. The power of live. <laughs> It's the power Sick. of life. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to get taken down for. This is the world. Oh my gosh. Oh, we're alive. The world's top podcast for these movie theme songs. It's, it's a little power behind. Li- yeah, yeah, yeah. We're behind. I mean, that's Hello, everybody. Head. YouTube world. Oh. This is our first live stream. What up? Wait, wait. Hey, Jake. What's up, Herman? How's it going? Pretty good. How are you? Well, things are going well. Um, what's going on? Um, we're just, uh, I'm just sitting here in the studio with okay. you, clearly. Okay. And all of our viewers from around the world. And wait, I think we have a special guest. We does. Whoa. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, say hello to Ryan Reed. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing, Ryan? I'm, I'm great. How are you? Good, good, good. I can't good. believe how smoothly that setup went. That yeah. was <laughs> it was it was unbelievable. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> we should get it happen like that every time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Ryan. Thank yeah. you for um, having me. Why don't we get started today? We have a wonderful event for everyone. <laughs> mm. <laughs> this is this is a this is a, a new chapter in history. I think this, <laughs> this event is. <laughs> <laughs> from here it's well i don't know what it is you did it guys you did it yeah <laughs> <laughs> we made it this is the pinnacle so ryan for those of you who don't know ryan for some reason ryan is a two-time golden new balance award-winning dad <laughs> um <laughs> and he is an entrepreneur and uh an mvp in the business starting world if you ask me um and in the words of a former guest, Peter Marullo, great boss, better friend. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I like that. Um, Ryan, do you mind just getting us started and um, tell us what you're all about, how you got to where you are, maybe a little bit of a backstory for our viewers? So good. The whole life story. <laughs> great <laughs> yeah. great uh, open-ended question. <laughs> <Yeah. And> go. <laughs> yeah. Um, want to talk about the business first or just general? What do you want to... Well, tell us what... All right, start with let's start with what you do and then how you got there from birth. From <laughs> birth. <laughs> so we'll go way back. Yeah. Deep cut. Um so I work for a company called Rewatchable based in Beverly Mass just outside of uh of Boston with um the very handsome Herman Disla. That guy. Yep. Yep. Hello gentlemen, ladies. And we make corporate <laughs> videos. So we've been in business since 2009 and we basically help businesses tell their story. Um, we're a pretty small team. There are six of us full time right now. And uh, we have a great group of customers and a great group of employees and every single day is fun. Nice. Very cool. Did you grow up in the area? Can you tell us about? <laughs> I did. I grew up all around the East Coast, um, but did grow up around the area. I went to school at Hamilton Wenham and wound up doing college eventually as an adult at Salem State for both undergrad and graduate. So, yeah, very familiar with the area. And my wife and I settled down right here in Beverly. So, it's, what, did, uh, what, did, what did you study in uh, Salem State? I studied business. I studied business for both degrees. Um, my background is in technology, so I worked with computers. I started out making websites and, uh, worked for marketing companies and then decided to go and learn how to do this for myself after doing it for other people. Cool. What, uh, what, what prompted the, the, the techie side of you? Where, where did that come from? Um, Mostly being bad at sports, I think. No. (laughs) No. Um, No. So back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, I got my first computer. It was an Apple IIc, and they were not easy to use, and I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved everything about it, and I completely dorked out on it. I remember when the internet first started, I was there. (laughs) Uh, I remember the first time I heard that weird modem noise go off, and it was just like, 
that thing clicked inside my head and I was like, oh, this is for me. This is pretty great. And then um, right out of high school, I learned that people could do this for a living. And I was like, oh, this is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. So started making web pages. And that was kind of where I got my start uh, working with small businesses. Mm -hmm. I worked, I had a really great job my first career, which was I worked for a small company that was a part of a ginormous company. Mm -hmm. The company's name was Savitar. And we were located in Boston, but we were basically the IT wing for massive, massive ad agencies. So okay. pharmaceutical companies needed a website. They'd go to us and we'd you know, make the website for them. Um, we, we got exposed to huge businesses and huge opportunities, but still had that really great small business culture that I still love today, where you can kind of all hands on deck and, and everyone's got their hands in everything all the time. Were you, were you coding or more graphics? <clears throat> so <laughs> let me take you back to the dawn of the internet. Oh. Um, it was coding, but it was really basic HTML. And the way a web page was built was a whole bunch of images stitched together. <laughs> <laughs> um, the text in a web page was actually text in Photoshop that would become an image. And then you'd make like a jigsaw puzzle of images and throw them all into a, a web page. So Sounds the like coding was rudimentary. MySpace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it should it should really resonate with Herman, who's still rocking that Hotmail address. <laughs> uh, I, I dabble in my Hotmail now and then. It's not a bad thing. Because they shut down his Prodigy one, apparently. <laughs> it's good stuff. Did Netscape have a email? Oh, yeah. I was just oh, yeah. going to say Netscape. <laughs> CompuServe, Netscape, all yeah. the old ones. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, that's my background with, with tech. And then... Um, about 10 years ago, I was doing Mac consulting and I was doing a For lot of Mac tech or? support. Right. And while I was doing that, there was this interesting thing that I was learning the hard way, which is when you're working in IT support, the better you get at it, the more miserable the people are that you deal with every day. Yes. So the better you get at it, the bigger problems they throw at you mm. and the more complicated problems. And it's always an emergency and people are always mad and always upset. And I realized pretty quickly that it was starting to wear on me. And then uh, I met up with a friend at a family wedding and we had been making training videos at the past company that we worked at and decided to give it a go and just start making videos. And that's when Rewatchable was born back in 2009. Mm. Um, we set out with all these kind of grand ambitions to, to make national grade commercials for small businesses. And we had this big vision for what we wanted to do. And, uh, and we promptly failed <laughs> and failed and failed and failed over and over and over again. And it was impossible to get this thing off the ground, but you fail and you do a new thing and you fail and you do a new thing. And eventually we found the right thing and it caught on and started building and growing. And here we are today. That's really cool. How did you get over the failures? I, I don't know if we were going to talk about that more. Well, yeah, more uh, later, but I, I guess, you know, uh, the, the challenges that <coughs> you, uh, you noticed, did you, obviously you, just say you ran into some challenges, but uh, were there any approaches or things you learned from other people that that failed or ran into these problems that you learned from and kind of uh, avoided them? Or we we were too early, and that okay. caused a lot of our problems. Oh. So what do you mean? What do you mean by too early? Back in two thousand nine, DSLRs got invented. So the Canon 5D Mark II was the first camera that we had, and it was beautiful. And it Probably made cost these, a million bucks. It, you know, it wasn't bad, and that's mm -hmm. what really allowed us to get into business. Um, with lenses and a microphone, I think everything, the gear that we walked out on on our first jobs was probably about five grand. So it wow. wasn't a brutal barrier to entry. And we were competing against companies that the old world of corporate video, these videos looked just terrible to us, and they were using fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 TV cameras that were – Kind of that local ad look that you had back in the 90s. Yes. <clears throat> and, and they stayed expensive because camera equipment always does. Mm. So we had that competitive advantage early. But broadband was just starting to get rolled out at the same time. So the quality of the pictures that we were able to produce was a lot better and bigger than the appetite of the businesses on the other end that okay. wanted the videos and wanted to use them. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. So YouTube was just starting to gain steam. There was no video on social media. It was, um, you know, we, we could do a lot more than people wanted back then. And the other problem that we kept running into was <clears throat> we, you know, both loved small businesses and we wanted to work with small businesses, but there's a limit to how cheap we could make these videos. And if we were going to a small business and eating up all of or more than what they perceived as their annual marketing budget, all of a sudden it was, you know, a really high stakes game to make a video for someone. I want to rewind a little bit and maybe I missed this because my brain was trying to figure out live stream you're stuff. You're severely <laughs> multitasking right now. Yeah. But I want to back up a little bit to how you got into the industry, like why you picked video mm. and why you – yeah, because, I mean, obviously you were technologically savvy. Yeah. Um, you had dabbled before. But maybe you can tell us what kind of uh, led you into that, maybe from your kid perspective. I, I mean, I've always loved movies. But for me, my love of movies was very different from what drove me to want to make video. Um, from my perspective, we don't make video. We make content. I think is the best way to deliver content from one business to another or from a business to a consumer. And I feel like... If there was a better way than video, I would probably hop off of it to the next thing. Mm. But, I mean, yeah, I love movies. I mean, Herman knows this, but, you know, the listeners obviously don't. But we're just constantly, like, playing with stuff and trying to make it a little bit better and a little bit more like a movie and like filmic. And oftentimes we have to get out of our own ways because that's not always cost effective. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that love of movies is very separate to me from what makes me want to make videos every morning when I wake up. What, what was it about the love of movies though? Cause I know people like, for example, me, I love movies that make me escape from any sort of reality or, um, that's why I like Adam Sandler movies so much. All right. All right. Worlds. I like Adam Sandler. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> and Adam Sandler movies it. are great. hundred you know? percent fresh is legit. What? On, on Netflix. Uh, yeah, stand up special. special. Really? One. It's very uh, good. It's awesome. It's very, very okay. good. But what about specifically movies? What <sighs> what is it? As it ties to rewatchable? Um no, or just, just what do I love about I mean movies are my escape. That's where I, I love just being caught up in a story and getting wrapped up and just being in a different place. Um, I'm pretty forgiving of movies, so a lot of my favorite movies probably aren't the best movies. Yeah, and <laughs> I also best. don't enjoy a lot of the best movies because maybe, you know, some of the most compelling and dramatic and powerful stories. Uh, I just want to go into a place and chill out and relax yeah. and laugh and yeah. laugh at something. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of some of my favorite movie memories are with you guys going to see like Geostorm or some <laughs> unbelievably bad movie that's just. You're just smiling the whole time. Like, I love that, and I love that experience. But tying it back to rewatchable, I think storytelling is this universal thing that everyone does all the time. And it's something that, as the internet has kind of blossomed, has been lost. And there's room for storytelling in marketing that there wasn't before. Um, There's a big shift from so-called outbound marketing to inbound marketing where instead of shouting your message as loudly as possible to everyone and hoping that the right people hear now marketers can create this really valuable customized niche content and try to pull the right people in with it instead of you know just broadcasting kind of whatever they feel like all the time and i think that allows for storytelling in a way that that outbound marketing didn't and that's exciting can you uh, go ahead so uh uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I, I read somewhere. I, I might have heard this in my one of my uh, recent classes. Uh, Netflix for a movie that either a Netflix production or a movie that's now on Netflix. You know, they play the trailers like right on the page if you scroll over it, um, and they have like five or six trailers for the same movie, um, and they'll play the trailer that most. Uh, most fits your profile on Netflix. So you and your spouse or your friend might not see the same trailer uh, looking at, you know, the 
two different screens right next to each other. Um, is that kind of what you're talking about, the more customized marketing? And maybe yeah. with that you can, for those viewers out there who don't know inbound versus outbound marketing, maybe go through that with them too because I think it's pretty important. Yeah, um, I'll start with the differentiation between inbound and outbound marketing. Um, so outbound marketing is advertising as you know it. It's we have this thing and we need to tell everyone about it. And if everyone knows about it, they're going to say we're great and they're going to choose us and they're going to come to us. Billboards. Right, right. Now, inbound marketing, on the other hand, is about creating value for your consumer and being there when they go to find you. So this is the age of Google. This is the age of search, social media, sharing, all of that. Um, it's about having the right message ready to be found and the right content and everything waiting for the passive person to come in, the consumer to come to you. It's, it's reversing the direction there. So valuable content and, and sending the right message are the big catchphrase that I use all the time on sales calls is the right story to the right person at the right time. And that's, that's the recipe for an effective video. And getting back to what you were talking about with Netflix, our Netflix account just got hacked and reset. And Whoa. that was the first time I noticed that because the thumbnails for the junky movies that I watch were all different. And instead of trailers now, I was getting clips. So they were, you know, they're definitely, they have all these different things that they're trying. And I think inbound marketing is the reason why they're trying all these different things because, you know, the way you process what movie you want to watch and the way your wife does might be totally different. And they want to be able to capture both of those things, especially when they're spending the kind of money there on the content yeah. behind it. Okay. I, I mean, I, that makes sense to me. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we can view that, right? Yeah. 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 I'm checking now and then. All right. All right. Um, cool. So, inbound, outbound marketing. Uh, started about 10 years ago um it was a grind is it still a grind it is it is we're growing now um in the last four years every single year our sales have doubled nice and that is nice but <laughs> it turns out growing a business is every bit if not harder than starting a business and you know you get you get to the point when you're starting a business and there's that magical moment where you're like all right, I don't need to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow, it's going to be here tomorrow. And you think, like, finish line, I made it. And then all of a sudden, the next job comes in, and you're like, uh, what do I do now? Like, mm -hmm. what's, what's next? What's the thing I have to do? And hiring people adds a lot of stress because you have to pick the right people. You have to have the right people on your team. You have to then have the constant flow of work to support that additional employee. Mm -hmm. There's all the back-end stuff to be managed. And, you know, it's it's a constant, constant grind. I will say that uh, the good news for entrepreneurs out there is there's definitely a, a diminishing amount of grind as you grow. <laughs> so, you know, we got as big as eight people last year and then scaled back slightly just to kind of reset and set processes. Um, but, you know, the, the fifth and sixth person are definitely easier to add than the second and third person. Okay. Which is, it's nice. So... I want to come back to that uh, comment you just said about finding the first goal people and then later on. Um, and the right people. <laughs> and the right people. But because it's a grind, uh, because, you know, just because you you got through the beginning doesn't mean it's you can coast afterwards. Um, how, have you, uh, how, did you find difficulty balancing work life and personal life? And did you find any remedies or I probably failed at it for longer than I'd like to admit. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even today have a perfect work life balance, but for the first six or seven years of rewatchable, I would come in in the morning work at the end of my day, I'd go spend two or three hours with my family and then they'd all go off to bed and I'd work another four or five hour shift. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't getting enough sleep. I wasn't getting enough exercise. I wasn't eating right. You know, if you're up that late, you wind up eating a fourth meal and that's yeah. not good for you. Um, I'm, I'm doing better with that now. And I think it's important to make it a priority. But at the same time, I feel like 
there's a certain amount of sacrifice that's okay to make if you have a good plan and it's working. And it's the tough thing as an entrepreneur is balancing that Mm -hmm. and knowing, you know, in your heart, is this going to get me and my family where we need to be? And, and are we happy enough? Um, do I, do I wish I had downtime? Yeah. Because for me, my priority is my family and then work and then me. And I think that's the way a lot of entrepreneurs operate. And, you know, every once in a while I'll have a friend or a colleague or someone stop and be like, Hey, what's your hobby? And I'll be like, uh, uh, hobbies. (laughs) That's, that's cool. But at the same time, the other part of being an entrepreneur that I'd think doesn't get enough not publicity, but attention is the fact that, I mean, I'm 10 years into this and I don't feel like I've been to work in the last 10 years. I come to work and this is just, this is what I want to do every day, all day. And yeah, we have deadlines and yeah, there are some tougher clients and more challenging work, but, um, there's nowhere I'd rather be during the day and we find ways to make the family stuff better. Um, I do have a more flexible schedule, So I can coach my kids sports. I can spend a lot of time with them at weird times that a lot of parents that have traditional jobs can't. Mm -hmm. So I try to make the most of that. And I really, really value that time. And I'm, I'm very selfish about that time. Like, I mean, part of, part of the hardest thing about growing a business is learning to delegate. And I think carving out that family time is a great way to force you to learn how to do that as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's great. Yeah. Sounds familiar. Do you see growth in your kids as you've grown or in your family? Like, do you find that you are all sort of developing together or are they two different worlds? Like your career and family. Um, Specifically, uh, maybe you can touch on, not to make this question super long, but maybe you can also touch on, uh, because you've had to, you've moved around a couple times to different states and stuff. So maybe uh, the correlation between that and your career development and that kind of thing as someone who hopefully will have a future family. (laughs) (laughs) When I, when I talk about my family, um, I kind of ran the cheat code and I married an amazing woman. And my wife, Leslie is the reason why my kids are amazing and why I'm upright and walking around. Can you hit the brownie points button? (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, I wish it was so brownie right. points, but I think this this is actually instructive okay. <clears throat> because having when you're in the stage of your life and you're just out of college and you're looking for a partner, um, my wife didn't sign up for everything that we've had in the last necessity. I've become this bigger, louder person who, you know, does things, does a lot of things. And she didn't sign up for that at all. But. I made the right choice early with her. And I mean, let's be real. She picked me, not the other way around. Um, But, but having a partner who will support you, even when things are hard, if I, if I see friends and other entrepreneurs have challenges, the ones that make it are the ones that their relationship is a partnership. Mm. And that's, that's huge because I mean, my kids mean the world to me and sometimes I have to hop on a plane and go to England for eight days. And sometimes I have to hop on a plane and go somewhere else for six days. Sometimes those are too close together and I'm not a good dad for that month or I'm not the dad that I want to be. And if you don't have that support system and you don't have someone absolutely rock star amazing on the other end of it, you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it at all. And for me, you know, all these lucky things fell into place. Um, My wife's decision initially to be a stay at home mom um, was really just driven out of practicality. She worked in an industry of buying where buyers, they make almost nothing. And then all of a sudden they make a ton. And she was still early enough in her career where we were like, yeah, we want to start a family. So it made a lot of sense for her to stay at home. And, having her at home and having her able to devote so much time to our kids and our family and everything that needed taken care of that. That's why this, you know, I mean, this isn't me, this is an us thing. And you know, the same is true with your employees and the same is true of, of everything. Um, and is that, that's all stuff you just kind of happened to learn as you were, 
Yeah, I'm just doing it. I'm a dummy running into walls and trying not to run into the same wall twice. And <laughs> I'm perfectly willing to admit that. Um, I'm I'm insanely lucky on the home front. I'm insanely lucky professionally. We have amazing, amazing clients here. And we run as fast as we can to serve them. But at the end of the day, we're pretty lucky there too. And, and that's a huge part of it. That's really cool. And a lot of why I ask that too is because I ask that of everyone, of Matt, of like our, our previous guests. But I think it's really important, and that's the reason why we started our podcast is really figuring out the things you wish people had told you, you know, as you were growing up, um, and you know they didn't. So you had to figure it out the hard way. So we're trying to minimize that. <laughs> Set. Setting everyone up for success, right? Yes. Or as best we can. <laughs> um, all right. So we've we've gotten into a lot of the uh, so, stuff we've we talked with Matt a lot about just kind of the beginnings of starting your own business and the grind and all that. And let's let's get into the meat of why you're here or what you you will want to talk about. What we really want to get into, and that's uh the finding the right people to work work for you or work with you <laughs> both okay both yes um well and so everyone knows ryan uh came up to me and was like i got it i got an idea i got something that i can finally talk about on the podcast <laughs> like we got to do this so i'm a long time listener first time caller <laughs> <laughs> Long time caller, first time listener. Yeah, for for me, um, what Herman's referring to is the process of we just recently had to make a very, very critical hire very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And we tore through hundreds of resumes and we interviewed about a dozen people. And that process was just like, oh my goodness, I can't believe there are people out there that are great people and wonderful young people out there trying to get jobs doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And you know, just I, I feel like it's valuable to talk about the employer perspective of trying to get that career going out of college because, you know, I'm the first to admit that everything good that's ever happened to me has come from doing it wrong and then figuring out the right way. And lots of young folks are out there doing it wrong with <laughs> looking for a job and how they present themselves and and everything. And so I think that might be instructive to your audience or sure. helpful i mean there's probably a, a lot of ki kids graduates that uh they they haven't heard uh enough advice regarding this or there's just a lot of bad advice out there at least that i've heard and i'm thinking to myself that that doesn't work well that and like it's going to help you just like be a better presentable human being <laughs> to someone yeah. who's going to like give you your job and help you make your living in general. So, so Jake, when you first got out of college, mm. walk me through the process of finding your first job. What'd you do? I, uh, set up an account for this. Uh, it, it's basically like your monster.com or indeed.com, but for teachers <laughs> in the area because uh, I wanted to be a music teacher, and uh, I think your resume can be up there, but you just, like, send them your, your info, cover letter, all that stuff, and they'll get back to you. Uh, on top of that, there's also a lot of networking in the specifically music teacher world and probably just teaching in general. So uh, it's kind of two channels that I went through, um, and you just you wait for a call back or an email back and for interviews and uh my first teaching gig ended uh ended up being a networking thing actually a really good friend was a teacher and said hey do, do you want a job we need a teacher and huh. there you go uh so it it is i mean a, a networking thing as cliche as it might sound but uh it's it's uh knowing knowing the right people and just kind of putting yourself out there and my first teaching job wasn't a music teaching job, which I was schooled for and trained for, but it um, 
it, it, it did certainly open a door for uh, the f uh, you know future down the line. Not for my current job, but uh, just being in the teaching industry. It's a weird way to put it, teaching industry. But, but when you were, you were interviewing for that first job, how, how did you differentiate yourself? How did you let people know you were amazing? <laughs> my first... That's a good question. How, I probably, many, how many interviews did you have? Uh, to start, probably, including the job that I did get, uh, no more than five. How many interviews within the job that you did get, though? Like uh, how many times did that place that hired you interview you? Um, just once, I think. Okay. Because uh, it was kind of a, kind of what you said, it was an emergency situation. Like, they needed a teacher, like, now. Um, and I actually went went in in like landscaping clothes because I was just a summer landscaper. And I interviewed in like these grubby, dirty clothes. I was unshowered, unshaven. It was wicked. Wow, funny. Um, that's impressive. But I sat down with one of the directors of the school, and we just talked. We just chatted. Super conversational. Super laid back. We just chatted about teaching and children and our our values. Our our goals as educators and it was it was awesome it was very low low stress yeah low key so um it was a it was a good it was a good experience for me in, in that sense but there were also the the jobs where i put on my suit and tie and it was middle of summer it was super hot and in an uncon air-conditioned school and uh and just uh kind of answering questions and it, you know there it, it can be intimidating because you want to get it right but you don't want to um yeah you you, you don't want to over talk you don't want to uh say the wrong words you don't want to make a mistake or obviously all of a sudden you you forget you know the a name of a uh, curriculum use or something you know you, you're you're nervous but depending on how um how much you need a job, you know? Yeah. So One thing I'd like to call out is how little of what you just said was about the technical music stuff that you learned in college or how you had spent the previous four years. It was all about you. And that's what mattered to the employer. So the employer was basically asking questions to find out if you'd be a reasonable member of their team, if you knew what you were talking about, and if you could help them. Mm -hmm. and your interview probably went very well because you're you and because you answered those questions mm -hmm. in a way that made them feel very good about hiring you. Mm -hmm. And I personally, having interviewed Herman, can mm -hmm. say that the same thing was true with our interview together was just a series of conversations. Herman didn't actually know he was being interviewed, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> when we were looking for a third person, we just went out with our friend Pete and <laughs> I was just kind of poking around a little bit because um, I already knew Herman before he came to work at Rewatchable, mm -hmm. um, but he was working somewhere else and we knew we had to pull him away, but I kind of knew what I was dealing with. But from the employer perspective, so, so, so little of what you've done right before you interview matters to the employer. And so much of it is about how can this person help my organization? How can this person be a member of my team? Is this somebody that I want talking to my stakeholders, whether that's customers or in your case, students? And that is what decides whether or not you get hired more often than not. Everyone, like, there are so many people, when we were looking at resumes to hire that last position, how many people had the chops to do it? Most of them, right? Like dozens. Dozens yeah. and dozens. Yeah. There are so many skilled people in the world. There are so many musicians out there that can teach another person how to play. But the thing that got you hired right away and the thing that got Herman hired, those it's the soft skills. And that's the big thing I noticed through our most recent hiring process and just, you know, every spring because our company rewatchable is really fun to work at. We have a great culture. We are kind of known for some of the fun things we do and we get to make videos all day mm -hmm. and we have a fun office here in Beverly. So people want to work here. So we get a lot of resumes and those resumes are all just technical 
and they're not focusing on the things that you got hired for and that Herman got hired for and that everyone gets hired for. And I think when you're coming out of college, you're, you're on your 16th or more year of doing what you're told and having tests on the things that don't matter and never being tested on the things that matter. And I think it's just so important for people who are out there looking for jobs to understand that the soft skills, the things that the conversation that you had with that guy is everything and your education, it's not nothing, but it's way smaller than people pose what they did and where they were on their resumes. Um, that conversation is so vital. And the fact that he had a casual conversation with you meant that in the first five minutes, regardless of how you looked, you know, you said you went in all sloppy, Mm -hmm. he felt comfortable with you and he felt comfortable enough to have a real conversation with you. And that's, that's, that's so, so important. And, you know, just to walk you through some of the resumes that I saw, some of the things that, that if you're just at a college and you're looking for a job that you need to be super, super aware of, the most important thing in almost every job is communication skills. It's the be able to the ability to relate to other human beings. So you see these these resumes that come across my desk, and these are people who went to schools that cost more than a house, and they can't write a complete sentence. Hmm. There's punctuation missing. There are typos. I mean, I've gotten digital resumes with the red underline under words. Oh, no. uh-huh. It's like you had spell check. Did you not just you didn't even care enough to right click it and and do that. No, that's how it's spelled. <clears throat> but you've got to be you got to be talking to people. Every single job is about communications. Every single interaction in your life is about communications. And if you're that if you're that person out of college who's writing that resume and sending out the cover letters that are just abominable text message strings, I think it's worth hitting pause and figuring out how you can learn how to communicate effectively. I think that there should be resources for younger people entering the job force. Like if you have a degree and you can't write a resume and you can't put together a complete sentence, and I'm talking about some of the bigger colleges around Boston, ones that you had to be at the top of your high school to get into those colleges and then your resume is that bad, hit pause, go work a gig job and figure it out. But that's that's humongous. That's that's the biggest thing that I notice. The other thing is not understanding what you understood that the soft skills matter. Um, as an employer, I don't really care what you've done. That sounds a little callous, but I care what you can do. And I'd rather see you failing in the right direction in your portfolio or on your resume than see you doing the right things at an unimpressive level. And that's one thing that I see over and over again. Uh, Great. You got a bachelor's degree. I mean, congratulations. It's like the price of admission nowadays. And honestly, some of the most impressive candidates that we had were self-taught, didn't have degrees. Um, That that proves something. Yeah, or their degree was in something completely different. It might. It might. The the interesting thing about a degree as an employer, because I look at them totally differently now now when when I'm hiring people is, I look at a liberal arts degree as this person knows how to learn and that's vital because, you know, we work with some pretty vague feedback. We, we work in an industry that's always changing. So you need to be able to figure stuff out. And for me, that checkbox of the bachelor's degree is this person spent four years learning how to figure stuff out. And that's, that's more important than where it's from or what it's from. And then I'm looking at like, I want to see what you tried to do. And I love seeing people who are kind of punching above their weight and doing really cool things the wrong way. That's that's always a hallmark of someone who's like trying really hard and trying to figure it out. Some of Herman's stuff that he was making when, when he started, I just loved. And just like everyone, it was bad. It was like, you know, he, when Herman first started learning how to color grade, it looked like science fiction movies. And that <laughs> made me think of myself because – the difference between Herman and I is I, I had to figure it out myself and it took me three years to make it not be bad when I was making a video. And Herman, meanwhile, four months in was making professional, unbelievable quality work because he was able to figure it out better than I was. And it's probably safe to say that there has to be a general level of like 
minimum meet the minimum requirements before you can or before the soft skills really matter yeah it's kind of like the uh you know you can be tim tebow uh and learn how to like do great things and be a winner but if you can't throw the ball then like you can't make it in the nfl yeah (laughs) yeah yeah no there's definitely you know the degree or the knowledge or the chops so to speak uh that's the price of admission but then getting picked you can sort of choose yourself by going the extra mile and trying things and doing things and it it makes it for an employer you 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 kind of have to put yourself in the employer's shoes and say why does this person need me and answer that question no one answers that question everything is very much like, here's what I've done. Here's where I've been and blah, 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 blah. And then pick me. And it's like, well, I'm filling a role. I need a member of my team. I need to know why you. Yeah. All that, all that past stuff, all that what you've done stuff, it's in the resume. It's there. So don't talk about it or you don't have to talk about it. You, they kind of have an idea of who you are going to be yeah. co- like in, intellectually. Yeah. And I think, I think what you're saying is a kind of a call out to employers as well in their interview process. Like, you know, don't dwell on what they've done, you know, get to know that person and what they're capable of doing, not just what they've already done. Yeah. And there's just this, I think there's a shift from in when you're a student, that's everything. And then it goes from being everything to being like this, this, check mark this checkbox list of like this is me it's so important when you're a student it's how you got into college it's how you get into grad school it's yeah. everything they don't care about the soft stuff at all and then all of a sudden they're they're like here's your diploma bye yeah. and you're in this world where it's the opposite and it barely matters at all to the people who are picking you and choosing you and yeah it's it, it's the life after college. You know? <laughs> That's the thing I wish I was told <laughs> when I was going out into the world from college. Well, not from college. Can you repeat that as a thumbnail? So that, <laughs> like, as a bullet point? so we Can Can you rephrase that so that we don't hear the question? <laughs> we interview people all the time. So that's, that's our way. Um, yeah, I just, I wish that someone had told me that the bullet point resume items were nowhere near as important as the ability to communicate and sell myself on, on those items. And that kind of leads me into the next thing that I was hoping we could talk about, which is selling and coming from school. I felt like selling was looked at almost as like a dirty thing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, Everyone needs to know how to sell something. And every every person coming out of college should know how to sell something, should have worked in some sort of service or sales role. Because ultimately, when you're looking for a job, you're selling yourself. And when you're advocating for your career later in life, you're selling yourself. You have to know how to sell things. And you have to get over that uncomfortable first hurdle of learning how to do that. And I think a lot of people that study specific things, you know, If you study music, it's every bit as important to know how to sell your music or to sell yourself as a musician or, you know, Mm -hmm. I I wish there was a way to get the stigma of sales removed so that everyone kind of looked at that as like, that's my fifth year of college is learning how to deal with people and sell something. It's not referring to the used car salesman. It's, it's the... It's, it's any profession, and it's not for a specifically a sales job. It's for a job, for a career. And I, that's something I was terrible at when, when I got out of school, and I had this amazing mentor. His name was Steve Lipka. And he actually went and got me a sales manual from Xerox, and if you can Google it and find it, it basically teaches nerds how to sell things. <laughs> and it it takes it from a very logical perspective and says, you know, identify the need, find something that fills the need, think about the benefits of the need, and then advocate for the benefits of the need. So if you're that nerd and you're like, I feel so weird asking for a sale or asking for someone to buy something, 
you know, that's something to look out for and try to find. Cause for me, that was an invaluable resource. And then it was just for me, you know, marketing for years, it kind of helped me get over that. Well, there's a good segue into our question <laughs> from Victoria, oh. actually. Um, she says, Ryan, is there anything you really wish you had done differently on your path to starting your own business? Anything I wish I had done differently. This was not my first business. So the, the, the first business was the, um, the Mac consulting business. And I wish I had not let them overlap for as long as I did. I, what I would say is, uh, there's, there's this great, uh, saying, and it's called burning the ships and taking a risk all the way is what it means. And, you know, uh, in, in the old story, Odysseus, uh, lands on an Island and the guys are all afraid of whatever's there. And, and he burns the ships to let them know that, no, we're committed to this. We're in on this. And I feel like when I started rewatchable with my partner at the time, um, we probably could have advanced faster had I been fully committed And that's one big takeaway I think I had where if you're going to do it, do it all the way. Take the risk. Um, I think everyone who's just had jobs their whole life and has had employers their whole life, the first time you're an entrepreneur, you don't know what's going to happen if you fail. And that's really scary. And everyone tries to hedge for it. And everyone tries to make it less scary. But you kind of have to just jump and let it be scary and know that you could fail and be ready to fail. And yeah, you get a plan for it, but maybe less hedging when you start a business. So how do you, especially someone who had a family, someone who was doing like, you weren't a single 20 year old, you know, how did you, when did you decide to make the jump? It was a purely financial decision for me. Um, you know, when the money from rewatchable matched the money that I was leaving on the table from the other business. Um, that was when I, that was when I went full time. So I was, I was a coward about it. I'm advocating that you take the bigger risk because I definitely, definitely lost three or four years of time because of that. Um, those first two or three really slow years, I could have learned a lot more, a lot quick, a lot quicker and been kind of ramped up Mm -hmm. and ready for more. Do you think there would have been a level of, for lack of a better word, like suffering from your relationship sides or economically or like that? Oh, there's when you start a business, like if you if you don't like suffering, if you can't deal (laughs) with it, don't start a business because there's plenty of that. I mean, my wife probably sometimes even today wishes that that we hadn't started a business that we hadn't done this or that we aren't doing it now. I mean, I'm sure it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. It's a 24 seven thing. When you own a small business, when you're running a business, it just never stops and stuff can pop up anytime. And it's the reverse side of the coin where you get all the freedom of being an entrepreneur that you pay the price with. You're always on the hook. And everything everything falls on you like you are the responsible one yeah and it definitely takes a certain you have to get to a certain point with your business before you can kind of make the decision and say all right no i'm carving this time out for me i'm carving this time out for my family like you those decisions aren't your decisions to make at the beginning and that leads to suffering that hurts relationships that hurts i i think i've fallen in love with my wife about 10 times over the 20 years we've been together And it's because, you know, the hard times in our life are when I can't be the husband or dad that I want to be. And, you know, I've had to commit too much to the business and too much to doing this when if I had my way and if life were easy, I would have just poured all of that into my family and into my relationship with my wife. But again, that's where I'm lucky that I have her because I know a lot of entrepreneurs on their second and third wives. I know a lot of successful entrepreneurs that, you know, have broken families and I, I feel fortunate and I also feel, you know, like we've, we've kind of figured it out early enough to, to make that work. That's awesome. Yeah. That's super important. Something, something I've definitely listened to in my early stages of careers and, uh, when I realized how miserable I was teaching after only four years, 
And maybe I didn't give it enough time. Who knows? But I was, you know, it took like the after after the fourth year and uh, looking for new gigs, new teaching jobs, and get and going for two two second rounds of interviews and not getting these really nice jobs and thinking, oh, thank God, I didn't get that job. <laughs> uh, I realized, yeah, oh. It actually took my it took my wife saying, "Yeah, you should probably uh, not be a teacher right now." Because I, I was miserable, and she was at a certain level miserable. So uh, someone's got to give. Someone's got to change. That's, uh, and that's super important. It's e- I think it's easy to forget uh, that there's other people involved. Um, and if it's your job, if it's your responsibility to take care of them, or be there for them you got to take care of yourself so that you can take care of them yeah sure. were there moments where you thought i don't think i'm gonna make it yeah yeah there were um there were times where i pushed my body way too far um when the money's not there you can't bring help and sometimes when you're growing a business what you don't realize is that that's when you're personally the the worst position you could possibly be in money wise so sometimes from the outside it looks like you're having tremendous success but the actual inflection point where you go up you get paid after (laughs) you do the work and there was a period about five years ago where i was working probably seven days a week about 14 or 15 hours a day and um there were there were definitely times where I would go to bed and be like, uh oh, like I, I don't feel like a healthy human being right now and I hope I wake up on the other end of it. That that's real, but th- I did I did a bad job managing that and it I could have done a better job in in hindsight managing that. Um you know, I, I was incredibly, incredibly hesitant to take on debt. And debt is a whole nother, we could do a whole podcast about that with entrepreneurship and the stresses that that brings. But, um, we should do an entrepreneur ser- series. <laughs> I know, right? This yeah. Is, this is the second part of our suite. Uh, yeah. The second part of the series. Um, but you know, I, I didn't take any steps at all to ease that up. And, and that was, that was dumb. <laughs> that was dumb. And it, it served no real purpose other than to just buy the time before we were able to grow as a business. Now you know. Did you, other than like I shouldn't do that ever again? Did you? Do you think you pulled anything away from that moment? It seemed like um, there's always moments where like you either fall off the cliff or you make it, kind of thing. You fly. Oh, great analogy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think for me that was a priority setting moment for me. Um, my identity was very wrapped up in the business back then, and having things be really bad kind of shone a light on what was important to me and reconnecting with my wife and being more present with my kids. I was doing this thing that I think it's really easy to do as an entrepreneur where I was with my family a lot, but I wasn't really there. Yeah. And I was like sort of (sighs) kind of half-assing it. And, and I was in the room, but I was like on a phone writing emails or like on my computer editing a video. And it's like, that's not valuable at all. And I thought I was hitting all those check boxes, but then, you know, I, when, when your health becomes an issue, then you realize like, no, that's not what's important to me. Like what, what really, really matters to me is what I need to spend my time and energy on. And that actually changed the business a little bit too, interestingly. And the business is more successful as a result of it. We were kind of a company five years ago that would just make whatever video came in the door. And as I started to value my time more and my time with my family more, I started to become a little bit more critical about some of the leads that came in. And now if someone comes to us with a video opportunity, if I don't think it's a good idea, I will tell them that I don't think it's a good idea. I'll try to steer them towards a better video. Um, Having your personal priorities lined up can help you with your professional priorities, I think, in a big way. Well, because you spend so much of your life (laughs) at the office, right? Right. So that 
right. makes a lot of sense. Um, Amanda Matinsky is glaring at me right now because she I'm the one that's there but not actually there a lot. I, I'm there but not there sometimes as well. I'm I'm, I'm that's me a lot. <laughs> yeah, and me. the thing that I think I noticed that may be different for other people is that that can be kind of corrosive to relationships. And the relationships that are really important, people stop caring about each other as people if they're there but not there, and it becomes harder and harder to interact. Um, I gave so much of my life to the business, and my wife gave so much of her life to our kids that all of a sudden when our kids stopped being babies and we had a minute with each other, it was almost like we were meeting new people, I think. We we definitely had some really awkward dinners where it was like almost a first date where this person who I'd been with for 10 years, I'm looking across the table and I'm like, <clears throat> what do we talk about now? Like, what are <laughs> what conversation are we going to have? I'm sure a lot of new parents have, have been through the same thing, but Fortunately for me, I looked across the table and was madly in love with the woman that was there. So the effort was there. I think people change all the time too, though. And I know a lot of good people who look across the table and can't stand the person that's there when people change. Um, So I feel really fortunate in that regard. I don't think that it's like I'm a good person who made a decision to be that way. I think I'm just lucky. That's amazing advice. I don't think I've ever heard that ever in my adult life as something that like you'll face in a relationship (laughs) but it's it's from the best of intentions i mean my wife is the best mom that i know she is the most devoted mom that i know my kids never want for attention or love or anything and that's her thing and she's just i'm a great great corporate video guy and she's a great great mom like she's unbelievable at that and you know, she, she also, you know, we, we had a weird conversation probably about, you know, seven or eight years ago, right. When we had had our second kid where she was like, you know, I know, I know that I'm not giving you enough attention, but like my attention right now is fully consumed by these little people that we have to keep alive. <laughs> little humans. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's the best of intentions by both parties, but you have to break it or it just gets worse. So yeah. It's the investment. You have to make the investment. It's like anything else in life. It's the dumbest thing ever. Whatever you put into something is what you get out of it. Mm. You reap what you sow. (laughs) That's what they say. Taking it back to the Bible, Herman. (laughs) Look at you. Old Um, quotes. Yeah. Uh, I I actually heard the same thing recently. Uh, Empty nesters when the kids take off after college or for college or whatever. Parents are then at home by themselves and they've been taking care of these little humans who are now big humans. They don't have to take care of that. And now it's like a brand new relationship and like, who are you? (laughs) Yeah. So I, my, my tactic on that is I drive my wife absolutely nuts (laughs) and I try to drag her to places that she doesn't want to go. And I try to take her on dates and Uh stuff that she's just like, Oh, this corny giant person will not leave me alone. (laughs) Oh, that sounds so familiar. But like you, I just don't want to like, I know how valuable my relationship with her is. And so I treat it like something that's as valuable as I consider it Hmm. because it is. And, and and things fade and they fade even when two good people are doing good things. Sure. So I know that you are short for time, but. I feel like we're just getting warmed up and we have a two minute drill that we're going to get to All right. little yeah. Ryan at the end. Um, but I wanted to, I don't know if we're here yet. So you just let me know. Cause I know you have a list of questions. Um, yeah. but, uh, you got another 40 minutes. Okay. Well, my mom has a Christmas concert I have to go to. <laughs> oh, well, oh, so. that's, yeah. <laughs> so he doesn't have 40 minutes. So, yeah, I don't have 40 minutes. Sorry, peeps. Um, <sighs> the massive streaming audience at home is devastated <laughs> right now. How many people do we have watching? Can you tell? Um, three. Shout Hi, Mom. Three. Hi, Mom. Great to see you. One, two, three. S- let us know a comment. There's been <laughs> uh, a max of six, but... 
thank oh, you everyone you suck that much for, um tuning in to this is the first live stream ever it takes i w- i was watching another channel recently and they do live streams like every friday or something but it took them about a year and a half to get consistent streamers and people watching and and you know i talk to people about this all the time at rewatchable with social content you have to create this content and this episode that no one's watching live people will go back and watch when you guys are famous when you guys are the biggest podcasters on on (laughs) earth you know it's good to have this like pool of content yeah (laughs) not now (laughs) not yet Uh, um i uh, he's brian's covered a lot of what I wanted to get into and uh, if you got more. Well, I just briefly wanted to ask you about random things. Yeah. Because those Let's are the best this. parts of podcasts. Yes. If you ask me. Um, you're a sports fan. I am. Can we just briefly touch on the New England Patriots? Yeah. The most confounding instance of the New England Patriots. Yeah. In recent memory. Are they amazing or horrible? I can't tell. Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I didn't pay attention to the off season because everyone was just enjoying using the Red Sox as a screensaver all fall. Yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden the Patriots come out and it's like, oh, you guys are back and <laughs> you're going to be okay and make the playoffs and then we have no idea who you are when you make the playoffs. You're losing games? Is it me? How dare they? <laughs> is it me or every year? Are they, like, borderline terrible but still win for the first third of the season? And then they figure it out and seem dominant for the second third. And then the last part of the season, they're just like, oh, it's the same old Patriots. And then they're either going to win or lose the AFC championship by a play. Yeah. And then coin toss the Super Bowl. That's the Patriots. Like, that's what they do every year. Mm -hmm. For the last 19 years. (laughs) Like, what's going on? No, this is the first regular season, though, that I've actually watched the Celtics. And that um, oh. – I got YouTube TV. Yes. And the amazing thing about YouTube TV is it has notifications. So I ne- <laughs> I always know when all the sports teams that I like are playing. And what that has had me do is I click the little button when the Celtics are on now. And I'm watching regular season basketball. And as much fun as the Patriots are once a week, the Celtics in the regular season are so, so, so fun to watch. Because – you literally have no idea who's showing up. They could yeah. get stunk out by like the worst team in the league or dominate the Warriors. You never know like yeah. what you're going to get there. So so I've been feeling the same thing about the Celtics that I do about the Patriots cuz the Celtics were like favorite to win the East. Yeah. And then Kawhi Leonard decided to be good again and it's just like the weirdest thing in the world. Yeah. So uh we're in the Boston area if you people watching don't know, but we have the most identity crisis team <laughs> teams yeah. teams because yeah. i don't watch the bruins much but i like to dabble and keep up but yeah. are they identity crisis as well no the bruins probably go one and a half rounds deep in the playoffs and then since 2011 they'll give a gentleman's defeat to the the <laughs> capitals or, <laughs> or the uh, penguins canadians yeah <laughs> no not the canadians <laughs> well we cover the pats socks celts yeah. The Bruins. <laughs> yeah, by the way, most fun Sox team. I think your 04 or 07 Sox, Ryan, are the funnest. I'm I was stressed lie. out during both of those playoff runs. I oh, did not enjoy like myself. As a spectator? As a spectator, this was a okay. pure fun postseason to watch. I think that's that's a huge oh, That was a lot of long nights. <laughs> it, was it was pretty brutal. Yeah. I wa- I watched but they swept. One. They swept the World Series, right? Yeah. So that was pretty fun. I, yeah. I watched one Red Sox game last year. Uh, last game of the World Series. <laughs> I was like, if I'm going to watch one, it it's panned gonna out well for you, Jake. It really, <laughs> that's hey, the one to watch. Great take one for the team. <laughs> I did the same thing with the TV show Lost. I saw the pilot and the uh, finale, and I feel like I got all of it. I really don't feel like I missed much at all. I uh, heard the spoilers on the local radio station, 94.5. Yeah. Like, the day after it ended, I was like, oh, that's how it ends. That's what the show's about. I'm good. Done. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to waste a couple months of my life now. Yeah. (laughs) No, we really wrapped it up, tied a bow on it. (laughs) Yeah. You're done. All right. And then I want to touch on, I don't think I've ever asked you this, but favorite movies of all time, maybe top three. 
they change for me all the time. I'm not a good favorite movie person. Current top three, Ryan. I need Take to get a list. Drill. I'm, I'm going to instead, I'm going to give you my favorite movies that a lot of people haven't seen. Okay. How's that? How's Perfect. That? Sweet. How's that? Um, Let's do it. I just watched Better Off Dead. Better Off Dead is a John Cusack movie from the 80s, and a lot of quotes in it that you've heard but don't know what they're from are from Better Off Dead. Like? Um, um, Booger from Revenge of the Nerds at one point is at the top of a ski mountain, and he picks up <laughs> a handful of snow and he goes, Do you know what the street value of this is? <laughs> um, at one point, uh, John Cusack's character falls into a dumpster, and there are two trash guys, and they, one turns to the other and goes, They just threw away a perfectly good white kid. <laughs> They're just little quotes like that from it. Mm-hmm. Ricky speaks the language of love. Like, just all these little things you've seen in memes that you're like, where's that from? It's They're all from that. Um, all of them. There's a director named Savage Steve Holland, and he made uh, One Crazy Summer and Better Off Dead and then never made another movie. Oh. And they're both great movies. So those are, those are good ones. Okay. Um, all right. What other genre do you want one that you haven't seen that you would love? What do you like? What do you like? Action and comedy are my two go-tos. All right. Those are like the movies uh, uh, I'm all about. I'm not a horror guy, but if if you know of good quality horror, or I guess just your favorite horror, if you watch it. So my thing that I love is special effects. And I'm not the biggest horror fan, but when I was a kid, I would obsessively read all of the horror magazines and everything like that because the makeup effects in horror movies back in the 90s, that was the, the pinnacle of, of, of special effects. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to tell you uh, about a movie that came out just a few years ago that is the scariest movie I've ever seen, but it's not a horror movie. Okay. And it's called Prisoners. And it's about a creepy guy that it's a kidnapping movie, but it follows it from the perspective of the parents. And it was pitched as like a suspense movie and just, oh, it's, it's terrifying. I was filled with fear, like (laughs) genuine, like, I don't feel good right now kind of fear. Um, So that one's worth checking out. Herman, action movie. Action movie that's great, that shouldn't have been great, that uh, I someday want to re-edit because I think it could be almost a best picture. The Grey, starring Liam Neeson. Have you ever the seen it? The wolf one where he fist oh. fights wolves. <laughs> I, I have. This is my movie that? theory. This is my movie theory that someday I'll get to prove out, hopefully. But I think if you pulled the, like, ten little Indians wolves hunting guys action scenes out of that movie, I think it's a great movie. Mm-hmm. And Liam Neeson probably gave an oscar level performance in it but the rest of it was really dumb and the special effects were awful and Mm. you mean neam leeson neam leeson (laughs) herman's ongoing theory that if you switch the first letter of each name it's hilarious every time but as a uh, rr it just i'm immune well that's why you're the great ryan reed yes ryan reed you never know (laughs) which one you're saying when you say it yeah um Another thing about movies, this is this is the first year where uh, both of my favorite movies are really poorly revered movies. Huh. Um, my top two movies of the year are Christopher Robin, the Winnie the Pooh movie about uh, yeah. Christopher Robin being grown up. Mm. Wall to wall, great. I think it's just a fantastic movie from start to finish. It's a family movie. It's fine for everyone. It's not one of those kids movies that just... Like, oh, I wish this was over. <laughs> like, please be over. It's a feel-good movie. And the other one that got almost no recognition when it came out and was quickly forgotten was the newish Mission Impossible movie, oh, uh, so Fallout. Good. Oh, when he's hanging on to the, so pl- uh, the plane. As, as far as I'm concerned, for an action movie, and people love action movies, so you can't just say they're all bad. Mm-hmm. It's just a perfect action movie. It's, it's perfectly nice. the pacing the amount of action, the amount of, oh, this is great scenes in it. It was, that's the best movie of the year in my book. I think you're right. From like making a movie perspective, it has everything. Yeah. Like if, if it were the, if you were creating a video game player, it had everything at like 80. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And they, but they got like the bonus points for doing it even like, it seems like that guy's a little bit better than he should be. Yeah. Yeah. Have you guys seen Creed 2 yet? Yeah. Uh-oh. Some great camera work in it. In uh, fact, there's uh, during the ubiquitous training montage, there's a scene 
a rare scene that I can't tell if it's a special effect or not, where um, I'm, I'm spoiling Creed 2 for you in the least possible possible spoilery way because you knew this was coming. But he, like, falls down, and you think he's like, oh, no. Oh, Creed's going to give up, and he's never going to fight again, and this is it. <laughs> but then he, like, rises up. <laughs> and when he rises up, they do one of those things where the camera zooms in. It's called a dolly zoom, where the camera's, the lens backs out, but the camera zooms in. And I just, I've seen the movie twice, and I can't tell if it's a special effect or not. But it's a really effective thing. They've also upped the ante in boxing movies with a camera technique where when a guy's about to be hit, they speed the camera up. Mm-hmm. Um, a director called Guy Ritchie, who you guys may or may not know, he made Lock, Sock, and Two Smoking Barrels, the Sherlock Holmes movies, mm-hmm. um, Snatch. Rye Gitchy. Snatch is a great movie if you haven't seen it. It's a little older now. Um, I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. English mobster movie. Yes. Oh, so good. Brad so Pitt. Good. Yeah. It's Brad so Pitt good. is an Irish boxer. You would love it. You would, right. Yeah, it's a great movie. And he, he, um, he talks with an Irish accent. I but Guy really Ritchie. I understand anything that he's saying. Guy <laughs> Ritchie figured out this thing where when there's a punch on screen, he speeds up the last little bit right when it goes through. the And it it sells the punches as being way more, you know, enormous and painful and awful. Yeah. And uh, Creed two did it during all the boxing matches. And that's how they made Ivan Drago's kids seem just nightmarishly strong. Um, but other than that, uh, the director of Creed One was a guy named Ryan Coogler, a really, really talented young director. And this just seemed like the go bots to the Ryan Coogler Transformers. Like it was just a little off. Like it wasn't okay. quite right. I'm really, I'm really looking forward to it because I love the first one. Yeah. The, I mean, the fight scenes are amazing. Like I said, the camera work is top notch, but it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's it's diet creed. So uh, <laughs> so what's your pick for movie of the year for the Oscars? What's going to win? Yeah. I I think this year's really up in the air. Is it going to be a critic year yeah. with some random movie that yeah, not everyone has seen that I, only I, aired in LA? Now there are a bunch of uh, awards movies that haven't come out yet. So we're in award season. So a lot of the limited release movies are coming out in the next uh, 3 or 4 weeks. So there may be something that we haven't seen, but pretty weak year for awardsy movies, in my opinion. So I think we're going to see some weird ones. And I think it's one of those years where the Golden Globes and the Oscars are going to have very different nominees. Because oh. it was a great year for movies, for like fun movies, for good you know action movies and comedies and just generally fun movies. But not a great year for awardsy things. So prestige movies, a little bit off. Gotcha. All right. Well, what do you say we move on to the two-minute drill? All right. All Terrified. Right. Let me set Should my be. timer here. Um, yeah, a lot A lot of these are similar, if not the same, as previous two-minute drills, but All right. we've changed some stuff. All um, right. Are you ready, Ryan? Yeah, I'm ready. The timer starts oh, wait, when you uh, ask the first question. Okay, that's what I'm asking. All right, cool. Favorite director? Spielberg. Favorite cereal? Cinnamon Toast Crunch. (laughs) Kraft or Annie's? (sighs) It's not even a question. (laughs) Kraft. Okay. Colgate or Crest? Crest. 100 degree day or a 20 degree day? 100 degree day. Pens or pencils? Pencils. One essential item that you need for work? Probably a laptop. Your favorite pizza topping? Pepperoni. Best way to relieve stress? Still working on that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, okay. Uh, Your favorite sports team? Patriots. Jordan or LeBron? Jordan. Are aliens real? Yes. Did OJ do it? Yes. Cool Ranch or Nacho Cheese Doritos? I don't even think Cool Ranch should be considered. That's Nacho Cheese. <laughs> wow. Okay. By the way, you don't even need to say Nacho Cheese. You can just say Doritos. That's how <laughs> That's how legit Nacho Cheese is. <laughs> Your favorite TV show right now? <sighs> Watching a bunch of them. I don't even know. Your favorite TV show of all time? See, I'm not good at picking favorites. Well, That's then, all right. Sorry. Dogs or cats? Cats. 
Oh. Guilty pleasure food. Nachos. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Zoo or aquarium? Aquarium. Mac or PC? Mac. Is Brady overrated? Yes. Oh. Wow, that hurts. Is Patrick Mahomes prepared to win in the playoffs? No. <laughs> Who's going to win the Super Bowl? San Diego. Uh, they don't even exist. It's L.A., right? Yeah. LA. <laughs> Country you'd most like to visit. Oh, and there, that's the time. Oh, that's it. It's not a country, but I think I, I, I oscillate between uh, Egypt and Antarctica. All right. Egypt, when it becomes a little safer. Yeah. Antarctica. <laughs> Do you want to finish it off? Sure. Uh, jeans or khakis? Jeans. I'm a jeans convert, by the way. Oh, really? I spent the first 30 years of my life not wearing jeans, and now it's just like, oh, this is so Nothing easy. Sleep in them. Right? <laughs> uh, your favorite party food? Can I use the same? It's nachos again. Yeah. I mean, it's so uh, great. It uh, works. Yeah. Your favorite musician? Herman Disla. Nice. Oh. I kind of knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather fight one duck-sized horse or uh, or one... No. If, would you rather fight 100 duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck? Definitely the little ones. 100, 100 duck-sized horses. Agreed. Really? Yeah. I mean, you could... The logic? just They're not going to take you down. How, how are they going to take you down? Whereas one bite from a horse-sized duck and you're done. <laughs> but haven't you seen The Mummy... Where all those little beetles are like, but they're they horses. Crawls. They can't climb. They're hor- right. the horses. Are You're so right. like they're a little baby. <laughs> you just Godzilla that <laughs> blah, 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 stomping all over the place. Come on, Herman. Unless they make a tower of themselves and <laughs> are they just like a wave, a tidal wave. Expect more from a varsity athlete. <laughs> <laughs> all right, last one. This is stupid. If you were a hot dog and you were hungry, would you eat yourself? <laughs> yes. Yes, I would. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Probably the bun. Hey, Probably can we talk about hot dogs for one second before we wrap? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, talk about Costco weird hot thing. Dollar fifty. Weird thing. Iceland. They love hot dogs. And what do you think goes on a hot dog in Iceland? Uh, uh, onions, celery, mayo, nope. or not celery, relish. That's one of them. Mayo, mayo, and tomatoes. I'm just thinking random here. I don't know. Mayo and beans. It's mayo. Grilled onions, and then the fried onions from the top of a green bean casserole. Oh, yeah. that sounds epic! Yeah. Have you had that since? And, and uh, mustard also. Sorry, mayo, mustard, uh, and then two mustard. types of onions. Yeah, that pretty sound, weird. That sounds uh, awesome. But that's a it's a strange place to run into a whole bunch of hot dog stands, right? <laughs> like you're, like, oh, you guys are into hot dogs. All right, that's pretty cool. To go there now. You ever been to Wiener Circle in Chicago? No. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a hot dog place where they pick on you. It's great. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Yeah. Well, I want to give a big thank you very much. Insert clap track to <laughs> Ryan Reed. Thank you for having me. Well, this was a lot of fun. Pleasure. Where can our guests, our viewers, find out more about what you do, uh, what your business, everything? You can find us on social media at Rewatchable on just about every platform, or our website is Rewatchable.com. And we want to give a big thanks to Ryan because we're at Rewatchable Studios, as I like (laughs) to call them, and uh, we get to do our podcast here. So yeah, very cool, super professional. We got all the sweet equipment, pretty dope. Yeah, stunt lamp and everything. (laughs) (laughs) That was a nice touch, Herman. Well, it was your idea. (laughs) (laughs) We got to get the lighting right so we don't look like ghouls. Yeah, and we're. I think we're definitely gonna have you back for. I think we're gonna do a year end Oscars like. Oh, Pete and I get to debate movies. Season Oscar movie. Uh, yeah, the two of them in together. Yes, that'd be fantastic. Uh, and next Halloween, I want I want in on a uh, redux of this zombie apocalypse episode because I think um, <laughs> there were two pretty not big zombie experts talking an awful lot about that. <laughs> I was quoting a book about zombies <laughs> from a zombie expert, so <laughs> that's all I have to say. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you for having me. Well, thank you thank very you. much. And uh, we'll hopefully be on again next week. So that'll be great. So hopefully you all can join us. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> and cut. <laughs> 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 <laughs>